I got nightmares in my head, I fear Thoughts build up until I can't feel My mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper I got nightmares in my head, I fear Thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper And now, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Not working. You can hear me now, right? Okay. Does it sound, sound better or worse? Is it a better quality of sound or what, do you think it's maybe not better? than you previously heard. Or is it hard to say? Do I need to talk a little bit more? Better, okay. This is what I'm using. I'm kind of using this sort of thing. So it's um, a little bit uh, more of an outlay than previously. So hopefully it is making a difference. Good quality, okay. Okay, so um, I'm back in the land of the living. Um, I don't know if you can see, I've changed a couple of shades. So I'm definitely, my um, skin has definitely changed tone somewhat. Um, but uh, we can actually do the true crime thing, but with a skeleton coast, right? Um, this is not a travel show, the True Crime Rocket Science channel. So we are going to deal with a true crime question. And specifically, we're going to be asking the question, what happened to the Dunedin Star, one particular shipwreck? Was that ship torpedoed? Was it some kind of foul play that took place? Bear in mind, I think it happened during the Second World War. Um, Namibia is an ex-German colony. Um, and they they were partly ferrying soldiers and I think ammunition. So that's the, the one question is, was it foul play in the sense of a deliberate attack or was it um, something else, like an accident, like a, a shipwreck, a ship wrecking itself due to nature, whatever you want to uh, call it. And so in order to explore that question, we've kind of got to familiarize ourselves with the skeleton coast in, in, in order to get a better idea of what was likely, we kind of want to, you know, sniff around a little bit. So uh, let, me, um, let me also ask you, without knowing anything, like without any knowledge about this particular ship, which one do you think it is? Do you think, I'm going to type it out here. Do you think the Dunedin Star sank because of foul play or by accident? What do you think? So again, just not knowing anything about um, this environment or the circumstances surrounding it, you know, what do you think happened? Do you think that an Eden star sank because of foul play or by accident? Thanks, Diane. And so we're obviously going to revisit this question, but we want to kind of get to know the environment a little bit better. And we also want to get to know the 
ship a little bit better and the circumstances surrounding the ship. Now, before we even go in that direction, I want to share a couple of photographs with you that um, that that you may not expect. That, that, that might might be a little bit surprising. So. So let, let me, um, so in the same way that I've asked you a question where you have no reference, or, or I would imagine you have very little reference, um, do you think the Dunedin Star sank because of foul play? I'm going to ask you another question where you probably don't either. The Skeleton Coast is basically a desert. Um, besides seals and the odd hyena, do you think there are any other animals there, really? Uh, do, do you think do you think there are sort of animals in this, on the skeleton coast? And so, for example, do you think there are lions there? Do you think there are elephants there? Uh, do you think there are, um, you know, those sort of animals? What do you guys think? Do you think that that in a area where it's kind of just sand, you're going to find elephants, um, giraffe? Um, what do you guys think? Sandy says elephants. Elizabeth says nope. Maria says I don't think so. So here are a couple of um, photos that that might kind of surprise you guys. Right, uh, let's make it a bit bigger. Uh, that is a kind of hyena, and those are jackal. And it looks to me like they're feeding on a dead seal. Right? This is uh, pretty much what you would expect to see along the coast. Um, and um, that is really the subject of this particular live stream. We're going to analyze one particular ship called the Dunedin Star. And it's really an incredible story. It really takes you on all sorts of um, uh, kind of sidetracks. Okay. Then uh, there's an there's a image of a ship that's actually on fire off the... Skeleton Coast. Um, that is a an image that I almost use as, as the background image, but it's quite a unusual scene. You you literally have very tall sand dunes that terminate at the sea. So you kind of have this very weird situation of um, desert. And then, like, a lot of sand and desert conditions, and then a lot of water. And, of course, you can't drink the water. So, you know, it's the sea is a desert of its own kind. But certainly, if you found yourself on this beach, you'd, you'd kind of be between a rock and a hard place. So, um, have you guys voted in the poll? I just want to address the poll quickly, see if I can find it. See if I can. So let's have a look. What makes the Skeleton Coast such a deadly place? Its, rem it's remote location, that is certainly true. 18% say remote location. 71% um, by far the majority say mysterious fogs and ocean current. Ocean currents. Um, if you think about it, uh, that is often the case all over the world. Um, uh, you're gonna you're gonna get fog and and ocean currents all over the world. Uh, so although it is a factor here, it's not something that's really that different to the rest of the world. Um, Two percent said the infernal heat. Uh, you, you you write that that it's not the infernal heat because 
actually when you are, although Namibia is really, really hot, when you are along the coast, because that water is ice cold, it is actually pleasantly cool. So, so the um, the temperatures along the coast are definitely not going to affect you, which which kind of creates a, its own peril, which is you're damned if you leave the coast to, to try and find your way through this desert. In other words, if you leave the, the coast, you're basically heading towards hell. You're heading towards really hot, dry conditions. If you stay where you are, it's pleasantly cool, but of course, then you're going to starve, um, right? You might take a little bit longer to dehydrate, but you know there's also nothing to drink out there. But at least the, the one thing going for you if you stay where you are is that it's not that hot. So um, that would be the wrong answer with this. Um, but I think something that is very underestimated here is the sand. You must remember that, um, uh, well, what you're seeing on screen is basically a situation where these big sand dunes uh, basically become a coastline. Is that going to have any impact on the shipwrecks? Sand. Is sand going to have any impact on the shipwrecks? And so we're going to come back to this question. Um, did the ship um, run into trouble because of a torpedo, because of a deliberate attack? Or was it fogs and mist, or was it something like sand, right? So we're going to try and solve that question. So um, there, there are a lot of wrecks. Um, some sources say 500, some sources say 1,000. But there's general consensus that this is the most dangerous coastline in the world, and we want to know why. You know, there are a lot of torpedoes hanging around there. What, what is actually the, the, the what, what is really the situation? Uh, I'm not sure what that is. Um, and then um, that's one of the wrecks, the, um, I think it's the Edward Bolin. Um, but that's that's a kind of a famous wreck. And what's so amazing about this wreck is it's quite a long way from the sea, right? And that should give you an idea of just how important sand is in this whole equation. The sand shift and, and what impact does that have? And as you can see, there's sand as far as the eye can see, right? And I must say, isn't that an evocative picture? Although that's part of a shipwreck, it kind of looks like a monster. It kind of looks like a wooden and metal creature, doesn't it? But you can kind of see in the background that the, the although there's sand, there, there are also rocks. You can see this is... It seems to be overcast, and that is often what the coast looks like. You can have as much sun, a couple of kilometers to the interior. It can be as hot as hell, but on the coast, it tends to be constantly overcast and, and a lot foggier than this. Do you have any more pictures? So there, there is a, you know, it's a picture I've used as the background, but this gives you an idea. There are the mists starting to roll in. As I said, this is a very cold ocean, and the you have a similar situation in the forests of Northern California. You know, you have to some extent quite warm um, land temperatures, but very cold sea temperatures, and then they interact. But you can see higher up here, you can see this mistiness, and it changes over time. So, so you can imagine in the middle of the day. There's less, there's less mist because the sun kind of burns it away. Um, whereas at night, there's kind of relatively more mist. In, in other words, the, the, the cooler it is, I guess, the, the more the mist has a chance of kind of lingering. Of course, you also need the sun to vaporize the mist in the first place. So there's a kind of a cycle. Um, that's a wreck that we actually saw, and um, in the photos that I took, this part seems to have sort of broken loose to some extent. Um, th this ship, is, this shipwreck is, I think, 16 years old, so not, not a very old wreck. 
But uh, there you have it. Um, you, you even get lions in the Skeleton Coast, right? And that gives you an idea that there is a certain amount of wildlife in this area. Um, this is an image of a wrecked ship that they're trying to sort of ferry um, people and supplies off using these cables. But that, that, that's kind of an on-the-ground situation. You wrecked, uh, you know, it's the ship is still pretty, um, what's the word? It's still a, the structure has still got its integrity pretty much. But that's it. Game over for the ship. And now you need to get everything off the ship. And then what's left is the slow passage of time. The ship slowly drowns in sand. And what's quite unfortunate with these shipwrecks is um, you, when you look for them, m many of them are, are, you just see one plank sticking out or um, very little left of, of the ship because it sort of gets engulfed in sand invariably. So there's another view of the um, skeleton coast. Again, just these sand dunes terminating right on the beach. And as you can see, as far as the eye can see, no roads, no human habitation, no 7-Eleven, no, um, no showers, no water, no nothing. And it was actually called the Skeleton Coast when a, when a writer who wrote a book on the Dunedin Star, uh, I think he was referring more to the shipwrecks and whale bones. And, and so he called it Skeleton Coast and the name caught on. And so now to, today, it's quite interesting, someone who wrote a book about that coast uh, came up with a name and that name has since stuck and, and that name now appears on maps. And, and his book, as I say, was a book investigating the Dunedin Star. And I must say, I feel like that's a book that I would like to read. By the way, when I was in solitaire, I picked up this book. Um, so it's about a little, very small little town in the middle of nowhere. And it's written by a Dutch dude called Ton van der Lee. So his surname is very similar to mine. And um, I'm already, I've already read a couple of pages. It, it was a bestseller in the in the Netherlands. So I don't know. Just so far, it seems to be quite an interesting book. So obviously, there's a, a, a story to tell regarding the Dunedin Star. And I'm going to try and tell you guys an abbreviated version, but kind of as an investigation, like what really happened there. So there's another um, image of a lion. Um, there's, there's a shipwreck that's quite visible. Uh, the Aristocat, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, but yeah, you can see how quickly the ship has been submerged by sand. Although a lot of the ship is visible, it's already um, quite far below sand level, right? This ship, I believe, is known as the Otavi. Uh, if there's time, I will show you a painting I've got of this particular ship. I've got, actually got it in this room. Um, I'll, uh, if, if there's time and if you guys remind me, I'll, I'll show you that picture. And, and then there's another one. You can see over here, you know, it's surrounded by rock and stone. So if you wanted to get to the shipwreck, which we did want to do, or if the people who are shipwrecked, they want to get in <clears throat> anywhere else, it's not so easy. <clears throat> so imagine if you shipwrecked in this environment, what do you do? Where do you go? If, if you're on the ship and the ship washes up onto this beach, what do you do? <coughs> okay, I'm going to leave you with that thought while I get a glass of water. <coughs>
Whew, okay. Right. So where are we? Okay, so this is what we're going to talk about. The Dunedin Star, and I'm going to share the um, the link with you guys if you want to follow. We're not only going to read the Wikipedia page because uh, there's a little bit of there's a little bit of a different narrative if you go to different sources, but we're certainly going to begin there. And that that's basically what's left of the Dunedin Star, or what it looked like in 1998. The uh, incident happened in 1942, right? So 46 years, no, 50, 56 years later, uh, th that is what was left of the ship, right? Kind of a chunk of metal, but the original ship looked not like that, but a little bit like that, right? So the original ship kind of looked like this. And and then after a roundabout, shall I put this on full screen? The, the original ship kind of looked like this. You can see there's a star over there, right? It's not, a, not really a small ship by any means. And so after about 50 years on the Skeleton Coast, the, um, the, the Dunedin star kind of looked a little bit different. Right? Uh, after, you know, after half a century, the Dunedin star kind of looked like that. Not much left of it. And, and so you can imagine if a huge structure like that, a huge um, metal structure like that gets reduced to kind of a clump of metal, you can, you can just imagine how harsh the conditions are, right? Yeah, that is, that is right. That is right. Okay, so we're going to start by just reading the generic narrative and then we will start to look at what what is also uh, mentioned elsewhere and we're not going to deal with everything we'll just really deal with the pertinent parts okay let's uh, bring it up so the dunedin star was a british refrigerated cargo liner she was built by Kamel laid and um as one of Blue Star Line's Imperial Star class ships. Now, Blue Star Line isn't that a isn't that a familiar um, isn't that a familiar name? Or was it the White Star Line that built the Titanic? Well, there's the Trojan Star. Just wondering whether the Blue Star Line uh, is related to. The Titanic. I honestly don't know. Uh, let's just have a look here. Uh, as far as I know, the Titanic was the White Star Line, and I think it was set up as a rival um, rival company. So it says here, by 1939, Blue Star Line operated 39 ships all of which gave Second World War service. And, and obviously, um, in the 1930s, 40s, ships were the equivalent of today's airlines. It was the way that people could get, um, you know, to other continents. It was a way for, to, to, to do sort of transcontinental travel, but something that was affordable to, to most people, right? So it's kind of similar to the equivalent to today's, um, uh, what do you call it, um, commercial aviation, essentially. Okay, so um, 
Here is a quick summary of what happened. Dunedin Star was lost at the end of November 1942. And you must remember that's within the Second World War and uh, when she ran aground at Clan Alpine Shoal in the South Atlantic on the skeleton coast of Namibia. Um, and I think we can maybe look at just the generic description of that in a second. But this is what we're going to really look at. A complex sea, air, and land operation uh, had to overcome many setbacks. And um, ultimately, all of her crew and gunners and passengers were rescued. But can you see, they tried to rescue them by sea, they ran into problems. Tried to rescue them by air, ran into problems. Tried to rescue them by land, ran into problems as well. And although they succeeded, it, it came at quite a great cost. Um, and so, you know, in the in the poll, one of the questions is, or one of the, the possible answers in the poll is, um, is there remoteness a factor? Well, it absolutely is. And I guess it's less of a factor today because of modern communications, but it's still um, it's still a factor. I mean, you know, the um, I can't quite remember the name of the ship, but it starts with a Z. Uh, that ship was wrecked just less than twenty years ago, so it's still an issue. Um, and this this is the part that I really want to emphasize. While trying to rescue the crew of the Dunedin Star, well, guess what? They lost an aircraft, they lost a tug, and they lost two of the tug's crew in the rescue attempts. So essentially there was a loss of life. Two of the rescuers were lost, right? So, so um, you know, if you say... Um, you know, in this particular incident, was it just a ship that was lost and, and there was no loss of human life? No. Some of the rescuers um, lost their lives, right? So, so you can imagine how tough it is to try and come to the skeleton coast to effect a rescue, right? Um, and yes, this is also interesting. It took a month for the last of Dunedin Star's crew to reach Cape Town. So um, think about that. Although they were rescued, you know, it took that length of time, more than four weeks, to get from where they were to basically safety and civilization. A month. So it's, it's almost like you're on naked and afraid, or you you're on a desert island, and um, it's going to take a lot to bring you back, right? It also took more than two months for the last of the rescuers to return. So how's that? So they obviously gave priority to the um, crew and the people on board the ship. But some of the rescuers that went there ended up kind of stranded themselves. And, and it took two months for them to kind of end up safe and sound. So, again, you can just see what a toll this landscape exacts out of, um, you know, people in, that are in the situation. And I do want to share a experience that um, Brian and I had where we had, Tommy's looking at me, he's like, what's he going to say now? Uh, where we, um, we, we had a little bit of a disaster. So I'll talk to you guys about that. Uh, Helena says, weren't you guys scared being out there? Almost a haunted area. Um, Brian actually said while we were driving, you know, you could murder someone here. No one would know. No one would find the body. No, you know, there's no cell signal. You know, it would be, um, you know, very hard to investigate anything like this. Okay. So let's, let's go on. So I'm not going to talk too much about the building of the particular um, ship. Uh, her navigation equipment included wireless direction finding, 
an echo sounding device and a gyro compass. So she had fairly, the this, this ship had fairly good navigational equipment, um, also a kind of echo location. And so you would imagine that this ship was pretty good at um, finding its way around. And so again, that raises the question, was the ship destroyed because of a torpedo or because of some kind of navigational error? Right. And so part of, I think, the answer to that question is, well, this ship did serve in the Second World War. And so obviously any vessel that is participating in, uh, that is on like a war footing and that it is, participating effectively as a supply line for a particular side is going to be targeted, a potential target of um, enemy, um, what do you call it, uh, of, of enemy ships or enemy um, uh, submarines or whatever the case may be. And so this was essentially a, um, just trying to make sure here, yeah, I think it was um, essentially a British-owned ship and a British-registered um, ship. And obviously the British weren't, um, were sort of enemies of the German Reich at the time. So I'm not going to go through the Second World War service just to say that she was a fast merchant ship. Uh, she sailed unescorted until November 1940. Um, she did several trips all over. Um, she went to Liverpool, Brisbane, Australia, Las Palmas, Cape Town, which is in South Africa, Port Elizabeth, which is in South Africa, East London, which is in South Africa, Durban in South Africa. That's actually where Brian is from. Lorenzo Marx, which is in Mozambique. Sydney, Australia, Rockhampton, also in Australia, um, Newcastle in um, New South Wales. So all over the Southern Hemisphere and to some extent, um, I guess, in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, places like Lisbon, um, Sao Vicente uh, in the Cape Verde Islands and so on. So we're not going to go through all of those details, just that the ship was obviously uh, used a lot, uh, was a real workhorse, uh, really got around the world and, and, and was able to get around without any problems. And so what caused this problem in November of 1940, which is 1942? late November 1942, and, and that's basically midsummer in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, uh, yeah, I'd say midsummer. So it's basically summer. So um, let's just deal with the end of uh, the, the last couple of months of its life. Dunedin Star stayed in Abenmouth for a month, leaving on 10 October and reaching Liverpool two days later on 1 November. Now, this is the last month, effectively, of its life. She left Liverpool with a convoy. There's the, well, that's the convoy over here. I don't know if you guys can see that. So she would travel in this sort of formation, right, with uh, big um, destroyers and, and, and other ships. That's how, how she would tend to travel. And... Um, they were divided into fast and slow sections. Dunedin Star went with WS4F, which is the fast um, convoy, to Freetown, which is Sierra Leone, right? Got there, no problems with navigation, um, and then continued to Durban, to Suez. So went through the Suez Canal. Um, so I think this is 19. 40. Um, she arrived on 22nd December, spent Christmas and New Year's in the Suez. 12 January, she left for Colombo. 
uh, in Ceylon, arrived 22nd January. She made the Red Sea leg of her voyage from Suez to Arden with convoy SW4B. I'm not sure if that's a, probably also a fast convoy. And then she made a fatal mistake, a fatal decision, detached from the convoy and crossed the Indian Ocean unescorted. So, you know, there'd been like two years, perhaps even more, where she was just sailing around uh, kind of uneventfully. And at this point, detached and was now crossing the Indian Ocean unescorted. And of course, the um, it's not the Indian Ocean that you see over my shoulder. It's actually the Atlantic. The Indian Ocean's on the other side. Uh, I'm not going to take you through Operation Halberd, um, basically just where she participated in um, I guess military operations. Um, we're going to pick it up. Let's see. So yeah, you have on the 27th of, now bear in mind, this loss happened on, it started certainly on the 9th of November, 1942. Well, certainly that's when she left port, but it basically um, occurred in November, 1942. Two months earlier, um, you actually did have a torpedo that was attacked. The Mediterranean Italian Regia Aeronautic aircraft attacked the convoy, but were repulsed. And then there you have it. That evening, an Italian torpedo bomber hit the Imperial Star. So th this whole idea that there could have been uh, torpedoes is relevant, right? Carol Murray says, Nick, I hate this but I watched your trailer um, called away, so I'm going to watch replay. Okay, well, we'll see you later on, Carol. Uh, Raspberry says, I visited there in 1997, saw the sand elephants. I'm going to show you guys the sand elephants in a moment. Um, right, so, so there you have it. The Imperial Star was hit. And no crew were killed, and the ship did not sink, but was disabled. So um, hitting, getting hit by a torpedo wasn't necessarily worse than kind of, you know, running, running aground. But nevertheless, that ship was lost. So yeah, you have it. Dunedin Star sailed in Malta for four weeks leaving again unescorted on 22nd October and calling at Gibraltar three days later. Now uh, now we're getting to the important part. Dunedin Star's movements for the next five months are not recorded. Quite curious. Then on the 22nd of March, 1942, now we're in the year that this happened, she left the Clyde with convoy WS-17 to Freetown. She then continued via Cape Town to the Indian Ocean, reaching Bombay, that's in India, on 16 May and leaving Colombo on 13 July for Fremantle. So that's in, uh, is Fremantle Australia or is it Tasmania or is it neither of those? I'm just wondering. Fremantle, oh, Fremantle is Australia, okay. I've actually been quite near there. She There she joined Convoy, Z, Convoy ZK-12, which left on 27 July for Sydney. Dunedin Star detached en route and reached Melbourne on 3rd August. Again, she returned from Australia to Britain via Panama. It's quite a, quite a route to take, where she called on, uh, on 17 September before crossing the North Atlantic and reaching Liverpool on 1 November. So basically what we have here is that the, the ship that was made in the UK was in the UK on the 1st of November. And I think her last journey um, was to Cape Town. That she com the, the last journey that she completed was to Cape Town. In other words, from Britain to Cape Town. It's a, you know, that's like a 
I think it's an 11 hour flight. So it's quite a long way anyway. Um, and then I think she was heading to New York from Cape Town. And, and this route would, so, so it's kind of the route that I would sometimes fly, not from Cape Town, but from Johannesburg, trying to get from this southern, uh, southern hemisphere, this far-flung um, place in the southern hemisphere to New York. And so I think if, if, if I fly, you would fly, um, not sure if you'd fly literally over the Skeleton Coast, but you'd certainly fly parallel to it. Anyway, the ship was certainly sailing parallel, very parallel to it. So, so that brings us to the actual loss of the ship. So on 9 November 1942, Dunedin Star left Liverpool for Egypt via Soldana Bay. In other words, that ship would have come round the coast, the, the West African coast, passing, obviously, Skeleton Coast, passing Cape Town, sorry, not passing Cape Town, um, uh, Soldana Bay is just above Cape Town, it's on the west coast, Cape Town's a little bit lower, um, okay, and then, and Arden, where's Arden? Oh, so that's on the east coast of Africa, that's kind of on the Horn of Africa side. Her cargo, this is important, her cargo was munitions, right, ammunition and supplies for the British Eighth Army in the Middle East. And she was carrying 85 crew and then also 21 fair paying passengers. So although the fair paying passengers were in the minority, they, they, they were still, you know, a couple of um, folks that were, I guess, paying for the use of the ship based on what it was originally meant for. You know, the ship wasn't meant to be a warship. And so here you have a Dunedin Star left Liverpool with convoy ON145, which is bound for New York. Okay, um, maybe I've got this wrong. New York, in the North Atlantic, Dunedin Star detached and headed for South Africa. Okay, so that, so, yeah, so just to be clear, um, the Dunedin Star was from New York, coming down from New York um, and heading to South Africa when this incident happened. Okay. So I've glanced at this. I haven't really studied it in detail. So, um, I mean, I've just, just gotten back. So let's, um, let's look at what happened in more detail. Um. At 22.30, and this is important, so it was at night, on the 29th of December, uh, of November, um, she struck an underwater obstacle, presumed by the subsequent South African Court of Inquiry to be the poorly charted Clan Alpine Shoal, right? So if you were thinking so far that, that she was struck by a torpedo, although that is um, certainly a possibility, the South African Court of Inquiry, that investigation proved otherwise. It does say here, it does say a citation needed. So um, it's, there's a little bit of uncertainty around that. Uh, her wireless operator sent a distress signal, which was received ashore at Valfus Bay, right over there. So um, that's basically when this happened. And we're going to deal with the really exciting aftermath to all of this in a moment. But first, I want to introduce you guys a little bit more to um, the broader history of this ship. And then also um, just introduce you a little bit in more detail to the Skeleton Coast. So I don't know if you guys can see on this website I'll, I'll put a link in chat there are some photos of the time there's a photo of the ship right you can see again it's quite a big ship um, there the sh you can see the ship the next morning still in trouble 
still in distress. And, and here you have aircraft that have been mobilized. And there's uh, a land mobilization. You can see a whole convoy of vehicles. And the, these are some of the people that are that were involved. Um, I must say that doesn't look very promising in terms of aircraft, does it? And that's basically the Dunedin Star today. Okay, the part that I want to highlight from this website is what they say here. Um, with the Namibian coast about 16 kilometers on the starboard side, the ship suddenly shuddered as if shaken by a giant hand. A part of her keel was ripped open with water streaming into her engine room. So basically, so probably what the Titanic felt like post impact with the iceberg. The crew immediately started pumping water out with five electrical pumps, but soon the water started seeping through the watertight door hinges. So obviously they weren't watertight between the engine room and the propeller shaft housing. Uh, the only obstruction according to the marine charts was the Clan Alpine Sandbank. What do we say about sand? Situated between 5 and 8.5 kilometers from the coast. That may not sound, um, or yeah, that may not sound like a lot, but you know, if you think about it, a sandbank almost 10 kilometers from shore, would you expect that? And so it was marked PD, position doubtful. So in other words, the exact extent of the sandbank was not clear. And so the captain suspected that they were actually hit by a torpedo. So that's what they're saying. The captain suspected they were hit by a torpedo because it was known that submarines were operating in the area. That's why I put the question to you guys. Do you think... The, that there was a torpedo or do you think it was a sandbank? Which one do you think is more likely? Let's have a look at some of your comments. Uh, alias is also some kind of river and lake on Google Earth. Uh, Matt Prince says, how do the animals get fresh water? I'll deal with that in a, in a, in a second. So let's, um, let's, Deal with the animals for a moment before we come back to this wreck. So these are uh, this is a really good article about the desert elephants of Namibia. So can you believe it? You do actually get elephants and actually quite large herds of elephants in the Skeleton Coast. Um, And if you find that hard to believe, uh, thanks so much. Wow. Thanks very much, Run the World. Appreciate it. If you find that hard to believe, well, then I guess you can say um, seeing is believing. You know, seeing photographs of elephants is believing. So, well, there you have them. You can see they're surrounded by desert. You can see there's a baby elephant. Uh, do you see any trees in this image? You, there's a little bit of dry grass there, but, but certainly no water in sight. So, so how do they survive? How do the elephants survive? Well, Elizabeth says they travel through. Okay. So... Is another image, and I've really got some beautiful images of elephants here. Uh, you can see in the background there, although it's kind of uh, out of focus, you can see there definitely are trees here and there as well. And what they seem to be doing is probing the ground for something, right? Don't, don't they seem to be trying to find something in the ground here also if you look at the elephants here they look like they are their skin looks moist doesn't it 
I mean, I don't, I, I don't think these elephants look like they they're suffering from dry skin. Also, if you look at this elephant here, it looks like it it um, had some water or mud splattered on it. So there must be water somewhere, right? Yeah, that is right. That's right. Okay. So there is water. It's just tricky to find, but the elephants have figured it out. So, yeah, you get a little bit of a better idea of what we're talking about. Um, there are areas, although there's sand and desert, there are certainly areas where um, you get ephem ephemeral, am I pronouncing it right? Ephemeral, which is to say very temporary rivers that flow to the coast. They're not there for, for very long. They're temporary and then they dry up. But what they do leave behind is um, kind of underground puddles of water. And so you can see in the background there, there's a little bit of um, food, a little bit of salad for these elephants. And so let's see what else is here. So I'm going to um, read a little bit of what is in this article. Um, uh, these elephants have been known to travel up to 124 miles in search of water, right? Um, This is also really interesting. How many desert elephants are left in Namibia? And this is quite surprising. During the 18th century, the elephant population was over 2,500. Unfortunately, a large part of the elephant population perished. Um, according to the Elephant Human Relations Aid, EHRA, the population of desert elephants in Namibia is about 150 at the moment. Um, Think about that. 150 elephants in this sort of terrain. You know, if you kind of imagine it, it would be quite hard to imagine one elephant or two or five somehow surviving in this really harsh desert where people can't even survive when they get shipwrecked there. And, and yet you've got 150 elephants apparently um, not just surviving, but to some extent thriving. I mean, do, do these elephants look look thin? Do they look kind of, do they look emaciated? They look, as far as I'm concerned, they look in pretty good shape. Uh, do they look like they're struggling, right? This one in particular looks pretty well fed, right? So um, there are quite a lot of elephants. So it's basically just a situation of, when there are not a lot of people, nature, even under du some kind of duress, even in a difficult situation, nature can do really, really well. Okay, so here you have it. The total number of desert elephants living in the southern ephemeral rivers of the northern Irongo um, region is 62. Um, then it says, since 2016... The population of Yugab river elephants has decreased by 32% due to human-caused reasons and challenging environmental conditions. So they are um, dealing with the difficulty of competing with resources with the people who are there. There are not a lot of people there. And also climate change. So... Uh, you may be sitting behind your PC or in your lounge or in your car scoffing at climate change. Well, for these elephants, it's a reality. There's a slight fluctuation in the little bit of rainfall that there is, not necessarily where they are, but inland. Um, also, if the temperatures go up a little, then that very thin margin that they're able to survive on gets taken away. And I have to say, when Brian and I traveled through Namibia, we saw so many animals that would, would spend just most of the day just standing in the shade. And I, I actually said to Brian, you know, we, we can't actually be out driving all day. It's just way too hot. And you, you really felt for the animals. You know, it was, it was really unbearably hot. 
and animals don't have air conditioning they can't have water with blocks of ice in it um, they can't kind of take a shower whatever uh, they've got to simply endure it so um, so 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 you know when you think about the climate and the climate heating and you think it doesn't really affect me i don't really care well it, it is affecting these poor animals in some way um right so according to ehra namibia nine out of 14 calves born died in the yugab and huab river so that's quite a lot that's um that's more than 50 percent uh, it's about 60 percent at least um it is estimated that 28 african elephants are lost annually due to poaching which causes severe impacts on the large mammal so that is still a factor okay so anyone want to look at more um more photos so if you decide well i would like to go and stay there myself the northern part of the Sketon Coast is where you would go. And by the way, let me just put a link to this photographer's website. I'm, I'm not going to show. Um, he's got 250 images here. I'm not going to show all 250, but it gives you an idea of, of just how beautiful this environment is. And where in the world will you ever see something like that an elephant surrounded by sand dunes i'm going to put it on uh, full screen so you can see in this image that there are um, and, and obviously this is um, close to a river once again it's a dry river but you can see that along these dry rivers are, are trees. You can see this tree has actually been pushed down. So there are um, ephemeral um, rivers, and as a result, there, there is a little bit of tree vegetation. Just... Uh... ephemeral yeah so um we actually saw this word come up quite a lot in the documentation regarding rivers pretty much any river in namibia is ephemeral ephemeral lasting for a very short time transient fleeting short-lived momentary ephemeral okay uh, where was I? It's not there, not there. Okay. And so these elephants have actually figured out how to understand the subtleties of nature. Isn't that a beautiful image? And there you really get a good idea of what the, elef the, the situation the elephants are in. Um, it is mostly uh, desert, but you have these dry riverbeds that to some extent soak up these ephemeral rivers and um, also, as I say, leave behind kind of water holes. And the elephants are good at... Um, uh, exploiting those and I guess they're able to do it um, long enough until the next um, until the river sort of flows for the next time uh, Sandy says does it ever flood there um, it can flood but I, I know you know when we were in Namibia people said it hasn't rained yet in two years, so um, uh, it can flood, uh, but um, it probably usually doesn't. I 
And the amazing thing with desert elephants is, is they are by no means smaller than other elephants. If anything, they're actually bigger. So there you see an elephant in action on a sand dune is a tree and look how big that tree is as well. I mean that the tree is really dwarfing that particular elephant. You can also see it's somewhat misty. Okay, Timmy, I'm going to put you down. So what you see here in the foreground is a sign that the when the water does pass through it, it, it moves pretty quickly. And obviously the, the water is coming from, you know, somewhere else, cutting through that particular area. I think I'm going to show you guys two more photos, but you're welcome to go to this photographer's website on your own time and, and just check out, um, check out his page. Is pretty stunning, isn't it? So we've uh, dealt with the elephants, and now I'm going to look at it in a slightly more general way. Um, you know, if you wanted to go and stay on the Skeleton Coast, well, there is luxury accommodation available. You can see the elephants. As far as I know, you fly in, you not, you can't actually drive in. There you can see uh, that there is quite a lot of water um, in certain spots. Quite a lot of water. I'm not sure if that would be salty water, but it certainly looks pretty good. Right? And so if you want to go and book yourself in, you can um, go to this Hoenab Skeleton Coast Camp. Looks pretty good, doesn't it? Um, we're going to get back to our story on the um, on the shipwreck, but before we do, just again, we, let's just familiarize ourselves with this particular location. So again, there you have the elephant sand dunes behind it. Um, there, there's a reference to 500 shipwrecks, lions prowling the beaches, 11 types of shark. Um, there's the Edward Bolin wreck. That was a supply ship for miners. It ran aground in 1909. That, that was definitely a big, um, big vessel. And this is where I got the... Um, image that's behind me and these other images. Okay. And then the last thing I want to show you guys is this site. Skeleton Coast National Park. It says it's 40 kilometers wide and 500 kilometers long. So um, it's by no means small, um, but it is kind of like a narrow band. If you, if you can say 40 kilometers is narrow, but it is a long, narrow band of what what they describe as hostile but fascinating, um, a hostile but fascinating landscape. Let's just uh, blow this up a little bit more. So it says here, yeah, the cold and unpredictable Benguela current of the Atlantic clashes with the dune and desert landscape of northwestern Namibia. And obviously that clash le leads to sandbanks under the sea. You have these subtle remnants of the, the dunes under the sea. Um, it goes on to say, this area has earned its name by claiming both stranded ships and whales in the unforgiving stormy seas and unpredictable currents. The skeletons of both animals and ships can be found strewn across the very northern region of the park in great numbers. 
Now, I have to say, when I was there, I, I, I also saw whale skeletons all over the place. I saw um, uh, lo quite a lot of dead seal uh, bones and, and things. Um, I wouldn't say I saw ships all over the place, but there were certainly quite a few shipwrecks, and you'd, you'd leave the road and drive through the sand and, and then just see a plank. And then you'd go next door and you'd just see like a piece of metal that looks like an oven or a washing machine. And that, that apparently was that ship or that ship. Um, anyway, let's continue. Despite the hostile character of the coast, there are quite a number of wild animals, as we've found out. Um, and uh, they are incredibly adapted to the rainless area. Now, someone did ask, you know, how... Can animals survive there? Now, obviously, it's not just a matter of rivers that flow in there. In fact, in the area where we drove, there, there was one very slightly flowing stream. So in, in hundreds of kilometers that we drove north to south, there's one stream that was just barely flowing. And there were actually a couple of ducks that waddled across the road when we went there. You can actually watch that on a video I've just loaded onto Team Beach Street. Um, but there is another way that some of the animals survive. This fog that, that moves in is moist. The fog is moist, and some plants, some reptiles, some animals are able to um, gather water from that. So I've actually seen lizards that, that lick their eyes and lick their limbs where the uh, water is kind of... Um, uh, what, what is it when uh, water water basically forms condensates right and so that's one way um, the same happens with some plants they're able to put their leaves in the air and they you know within the spirals or thorns or whatever it is drops of water sometimes form just as a result of these um waves of fog moving in and you know it's maybe similar to the the giant redwoods you know they have a way of somehow absorbing some of that moisture um i really like the way this is written um even though all evidence points to an incredibly unwelcoming and desolate area so if you think about it, it is an area that, that's very unwelcome. That, you know, there's no, um, there, there are very few resources for the tourist. There, you don't, you, there's not a lot, even the place that we stayed in on um, Terrace Bay had no air conditioners. Um, there's really not much there. And, and nevertheless, scores of tourists make the long journey to experience just that, to experience this harsh climate and this harsh terrain. And I must say, Brian, this wasn't my first time to the area. It was Brian's first time. And he said over and over again, almost like he just couldn't believe his eyes. He was like, wow, there's nothing here. And, you know, I think there's a sense that human beings have conquered the earth and human beings have dominion over the earth. Well, this is one place where the footprint of man is minimal very very minimal that's how harsh the conditions are um it says here the the northern the park is divided into two sections the northern part is wilder and more desolate and almost completely inaccessible yet home to the famous beach of wrecks now i must say i really wanted to go to the north but i was told it was closed um there's actually a very interesting story about when we did go north and what happened. I don't know if there'll be time to tell you guys, but that's definitely a um, bit of drama on our trip. Um, anyway, it says here, there's also the southern area where one can venture by road, visit the year-round seal colony, and go off the beaten track. Uh, they say it's easy to understand why the Skeleton Coast is acknowledged as one of Namibia's greatest treasures and one of the world's last great wildernesses. 
And if you think about it, I don't know if Liesl is still here. Um, some of the last wildernesses in the world are the most remote. Some of the last wildernesses in the world are places where there might be water, but it's nevertheless very hard to make a living there. Places like Alaska, places like um, the Skeleton Coast. You know, there's these very narrow margins that the animals are able to um, figure out how to um, deal with the subtleties of, you know, where is water and and better than we are. And so they are able to they are they are able to survive there um, when we wouldn't be able to. And and I think they are also there because we're not there. If we were there, they wouldn't be there. So it's quite uh, quite amazing. Okay, so what else do I want to share with you? Um, so I think before we deal with this particular site. I want to go back to our story. Are you guys happy with that? So we we at the point now where the ship has basically um, floundered, um, and um, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? Flounder, right? To flounder means to struggle or stagger, to um, toss and turn, to pitch, to be in serious difficulty. And so that is what is, was what was happening here, right? Um, let's put it up like that. Let's look at some of your questions. What does Sandra say? Lake Eyre is, the, is in the desert and falls after flooding rains. Fish, birds, then nada. Yeah. So, you know what is what is also interesting with the with Namibia is there are miles and miles of nothing, and then you'll find like a watering hole and 30, 30 elephants. I mean that's what we found. You'll find miles and miles of nothing, and then you'll find three hundred fifty thousand seals. Um, besides that, th th this is also one of the richest diamond areas in the world. Uh, the, the diamonds are literally, you know, in, in the movie Dune, spice is, is like within the sand all over. In Namibia, there are literally diamonds all over the place. Um, the rivers actually uh, flow over um diamond bearing rock and then often uh, spool all of these diamonds into the sea and then ships come along and literally vacuum up um, the, the these sediments with the diamonds and so as a result the, the large sectors of the coast that you're not allowed to go to simply because there is likely to be diamonds and they don't want people picking up diamonds um, I know people who work there get body searched and cavity searched. Um, so you've got this really interesting dynamic where you've got a country that's barren and empty, and yet there's so much life and so much value in a way, um, regardless of, of that, of what it appears. So, yeah, definitely quite interesting. Um, someone just asked the same question that I was thinking. Is it um, founded or floundered? Well, found to founder is is that founder sink, go to the bottom, go down. F flounder is to struggle. So I guess I guess you could say both. You first flounder and then you founder, but you flounder struggle you first may be in serious difficulty and then you founder but certainly a ship that goes down is typically foundering anyway let's not 
worry too much about that. Okay, so let's um, let's continue. Um, so here we go. Dunedin Star began rapidly taking on water, and her pumps were unable to cope. The master, Captain R.B. Lee, chose to beach the ship for the safety of her passengers, crew, and valuable cargo. Remember, they're also carrying weapons, right? In a heavy sea, she grounded 500 meters offshore, about 50 miles south of the Cuneni River mouth, which formed the border with Portuguese Angola. So basically in the middle of nowhere. But um, grounding... 500 meters offshore is, is quite a substantial distance. Um, it's half a kilometer. It's more than a quarter of a mile. It's quite a long way. And that water is ice, ice cold. So, you know, that's already quite a precarious situation. The fact that she grounded that distance offshore, to me, also seems to suggest that there was a sandbank involved. And we saw earlier that um, that sandbank could have been um, the Clan Alpine Shoal, which, as they've said there, was poorly charted. Uh, Captain Lee feared the heavy sea would break up the ship, therefore he had the crew lower her motorboat and start putting people ashore. So at least they had a motorized vessel that could ferry people around. The boat completed two, two trips, putting ashore a total of 63 people, including eight women, three babies, and a number of elderly men. Then the rough sea disabled the boat, and she was stranded, stranded on the beach. So literally what's happened here is this motorized boat, which is the first rescue vessel essentially, also gets basically destroyed. So there's a partial rescue of babies, of a couple of women and some elderly men, and then that that first mechanism was out of the equation. So what what happens next? Um, so it says here they were left with no shelter and only the boat's water and food rations to sustain them. Another forty two people were left aboard the beach ship. So you know they got more than sixty percent of the people off the ship but roughly half were still kind of left behind. And that's the dilemma. Now, how do we get, how do we, how do we rescue these people in this sort of godforsaken place where they are stranded? Like, how do we solve this problem? And that's, that's where the uh, story gets really, really interesting. I, I do want to mention that when Brian and I were at the Skeleton Coast, we were astonished just at the, the power of the sea, you know, um, big waves breaking pretty hard. And um, it's, it's just a pretty um, kind of violent and um, what's the word, uh, kind of untamed coastline. The, the, the waves are big. Um, the, the, the many of the beaches are sloped quite um, at quite a sharp angle. So, you know, it's not really the sort of place where you go, oh, I'm going to go and jump in the sea. And Brian actually said that he was going to, while we were driving, he said, I'm, I, I want to jump in the sea. And then when we got there, then he would change his mind. And then we'd come to another place from a distance that looked quite nice. As we got closer, okay, no, I'm not going to do that. Part of the reason was the water was ice cold, but the other reason is, the, the sea is very, very rough. And what they, what they say somewhere in the literature is it's not a problem for um, boats, especially sailboats, especially before the motorized era, not a problem for those craft to beach themselves. But you're not going to have a hope of getting yourself off the beach once you're on the beach, right? Uh, thanks a lot, Maria. I really appreciate it. So Diane asks, did another ship come? Well, the answer is yes, but did that did that ship arrive without drama? Okay, let's uh, let's find out what happens next. 
Are you guys enjoying this? Are you finding it interesting? A South African Railways and Harbors tug, the 328 GRT. Uh, left Wolfus Bay and headed north to reach the wreck. Now, Wolfus Bay is the same area where uh, Brian and I went on that kind of a boat cruise. Um, so let me see if I can just show you a little bit of... And, and when we were there, I must say the um, the the, yeah. the harbor was very um, misty. So, and, uh, uh, if you haven't watched this video, make sure you do. But this is a, a video I took from Wolfus Bay, and you can see how misty it is. Wolfus Bay is not on the skeleton coast, it's south of it, but the conditions are kind of similar. Can you see the mist in the background? That's actually the harbor that you can't quite see there. That's a big cargo ship that appeared out of the mist. There you can see it as well. And I just wanted to show you guys that just to give you a real sense of that these mists are everywhere. You know they are they are present day after day, year round. <coughs> and um, <clears throat> just a second. Brian made the comment that if our boat overturned, we would be, even though we weren't far from anywhere, we wouldn't really know which way to swim because you would you were totally disoriented. Sandy says, much more interesting than court proceedings to me. Okay, so let's deal with this, this tugboat that leaves Wolfus Bay. <clears throat> uh, sorry, we need to be there. Let's need another sip of water. So when we drove through Namibia, everywhere we went, we, we took two five liter bottles of water just to just in case something did happen um most areas north of Vintuk, basically in line with itosha you don't really have cell signals so if you break down you've got to just wait till some vehicle passes you and often when you're driving you can drive for half an hour or an hour and maybe one vehicle passes you um, anyway, so let's continue. So, a South African Railways and Harbours tug, the 328 GRT, Sir Charles Elliott, left Wolfus Bay and headed north to reach the wreck. So, it's, what's quite interesting here is that, um, bear in mind, in 1948, South Africa basically was a, a steward basically had custody of the country of Namibia, um, if that makes sense. So, so the, the whole country of Namibia was basically um, belonged essentially to South Africa. Um, although South Africa, it was a protectorate, so Namibia was the protectorate, um, um, 
it only became an independent country relatively recently, like in the last 20 years. Anyway, and so that is why, and by the way, um, Wolfus Bay, which means Whale Bay, um, was, was, was a South African enclave in a way. So anyway, you can see that it's a South African um, owned vessel that is coming to the rescue here. The 197 GRT minesweeper HMSAS Nareen, uh, a converted civilian le uh, vessel, left Wolfers Bay at 2 o'clock on the 30th of November, laden with emergency supplies. So essentially two ships were dispatched, uh, one from South Africa and another basically a British ship, a, a minesweeper, that ship. Again, this does make you wonder, could it have been, as a precaution, you know, were there possibly uh, submarines in the area and was the ship torpedoed? Um, they say it was laden with emergency supplies packed into Kali floats. That's what a Kali float looks like. It kind of looks like a dinghy and um, taken ashore to the survivors on the beach. Then there's a third ship, the Norwegian 6465 GRT cargo ship Temeraire. I don't know if we can get any information about that. Not much information on there. And Manchester liners, um, another steamship, Manchester Division, also diverted to help. So quite a few ships have responded to this um, situation. Meanwhile, from Vintuk, which is a the capital of Namibia, but it's a landlocked capital, a land rescue convoy led by Captain J.W. Smith of the South African police. So again, it's not, Namibia is not really a country at this time. It's still governed essentially by South Africa. So you've got the South African police coming to the rescue South African railways also coming to the rescue, uh, trying to reach the survivors who were ashore. Um, the ships reached an Eden Star on 1 or 2 December, so it really only took how long? Um, two, three days, I think. From 29 November to 1 December. So it really just took a day or two for other ships to arrive on scene from the nearby uh, Namibian harbors. Nareen launched some of her supply-laden Kali floats to reach the shore party, but the strong current swept them away. So, so there you can see just how frequent treacherous it is. Um, you know, you, you, would, you would imagine that you arrive there, you, you got your ship there, and you just throw these floats aboard, and you think, well, the, you know, it's just going to float and the, the waves are going to take them to the beach. And guess what happened? That's not what happened. <laughs> That's not what happened. The, the, the currents are so strong that zip, the floats were, were taken away. And so th these um, much needed supplies are now just unavailable, right? Frustrating, right? Um. Robbie Robbins says, amazing how many people went to the rescue. And that's probably why people were rescued, why it was successful, because it, it was um, not underestimated what was required, right? Um, she moved closer to the shore, so the ship moved closer and then launched her remaining floats. They don't say really what happened to those and returned to Wolfers Bay. So, that was obviously a risk, trying to go as close to the shore as possible. Temerir launched her motorboat and took 10 men off Dunedin Star. Now, remember, there were something like over 40 people that were still aboard this um, floundering ship. And um, it hasn't foundered yet, right? And, um, and so they were able to um, get another 10 off, but the ship, but the boat shipped a lot of water, which stopped her motor. 
So this is the second rescue craft, the boat that is now basically run into trouble. So basically you've had two rescue speedboats that have uh, broken down and you've had the floats basically just washed away by the currents. Then you had the Norwegian uh, boatman rowing for an hour and a half to Manchester Division, which took the 10 survivors aboard. So, so you had Norwegians rowing in order to uh, get those survivors to safety. So this was a real team effort. The Norwegians were now so exhausted that Temerer had to take them and their, their boat back aboard. So you can almost imagine that that rowing effort was a one one off. And what's quite interesting, think about the Norwegians, they the related to the Vikings, and the Vikings many years ago would also have done things like this, rowing in rough seas. Anyway, the next day, Sir Charles Elliott arrived, that's the tug. Temeraire again lowered a motorboat, which in four trips rescued the remaining 32 men from the Dunedin Star. So probably they fixed the engine, and with Sir Charles Elliott there, they were able to rescue everybody else. They transferred them to Sir Charles Elliott. In the heavy sea, the tug then struggled to get alongside Manchester Division to transfer all of the rescued men um, who were taken aboard Noreen. So now the tug is also struggling. And there you have confirmation that the sea is heavy. Even vessels coming, they're totally fine and, and, in, and presumably good daylight conditions, they are struggling. On 3rd December, Sir Charles Elliott left to return to Walfus Bay, but about 6 o'clock the next morning, she grounded just north of Rocky Point. So this tugboat that went to rescue now got lost as well. So how many how many um, uh, craft is that now that are being lost? Most of her crew managed to swim ashore through the strong current, but First Officer Angus McIntyre and deckhand Matthias Korosev did not survive. So there you have two casualties as early as the 3rd of December from this rescue craft. Again, are you, are you guys getting a sense of just how tough it is just to try and do simple things in this terrain? It's challenging. It is easy to underestimate certain things and, and, and not to consider other things, right? Right, so let's continue. At 2 o'clock on the 3rd of December, South African Air Force Lockheed Ventura, looks like that, <clears throat> looks like that. Um, so this is... Now they're trying air support. They've tried ships, and now they're going to try um, affecting a rescue by air. It was sent from Cape Town to drop supplies on the beach for the su survivors. Why do they need to drop supplies on the beach? Well, because the ship that brought this, the supplies dropped the supplies into a current, which got whisked away and, and was of no use. So now they bring an aircraft to, to drop the supplies directly onto the beach. At 20 minutes past four, Captain Immens Nordia found the beach. So it took two hours, 20 minutes to kind of get there after taking off. His crew dropped the supplies, but most were destroyed on impact. So again, can you see how frustrating this is? They dropped the supplies. Uh, when they say destroyed on impact, I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, what what could have been destroyed? I mean, can food be destroyed on impact? But I suppose if you've dropped bottles of water, they can be burst when they land and then all the water seeps into the sand. Nordia landed, so Nordia lands this plane on a nearby flat piece of land with the intention of rescuing some of the remaining survivors. Um, do you think that's going to work? So he actually lands his plane quite near to the people, and he, he, he's thinking, "Well, I can just get a couple of the survivors on board." Do you think that's going to that's going to work? Do you think it's going to be that simple? I can just land a plane, and 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 we can just take the survivors out of there. It's easy. You know, you just land a plane, 
and then and then leave. It, you know, it's not it's not going to be a problem. Do you think? Do you think he's going to be able to get away with that? Well, this is what happens. Uh, unfortunately, the land was a salt pan, right? Uh, obscured by desert sand. So he thought he was landing on a nice, uh, hard, level area, but actually it was something else. The next day it was discovered that the Ventura's undercarriage, that's that part, had sunk through the crusted surface of the salt, damaging the aircraft and leaving it stuck in the sand. So after landing in the desert, they, they were basically stuck. And that's what the, the plane looked like. Uh, Earth says it could definitely not that simple. And you are right about that. So you can see how complicated this is getting. You can see also how you need to think critically, like what is going on? How do we need to figure this out? Um, so now they send three other SA. SAA Venturas um, flying supply missions to drop water, food, and other emergency supplies. Why is that necessary? Well, because the first boat that tried to drop supplies, those supplies were lost. Um, another boat went a bit closer. Presumably, those supplies either were lost or were not enough. Then the another an airplane dropped supplies and they were destroyed. Um, probably they needed to drop these supplies either in a cushioned, uh, in, in cushioned packaging or try and sort of let it land on like a, a sand dune or something, something soft, if there was that, that sort of thing in the area. Okay. Um, they often flew several flights a day to the survivors on the beach. So can you see what's actually happening here is, they know where the survivors are, but they, they sort of just can't get to them. Um, I'm talking about the survivors on the beach. The survivors on the ship have been transferred to another ship and they're basically safe. But there's still survivors on the beach that are basically just stuck there. They can't, they can't get out of there. They can't walk out of there and it's very hard to get there. There's not like a, a highway or a road to get there. So how do you get there? So planes tried to land there. That didn't work. They sent other planes, to, uh, other planes with supplies just to keep the people alive. And now they have got to figure out how do we get to these people? How do we get them out of there? And obviously it's not going to work going by boat. Um, so they've got to find some other solution. Okay. Um, they flew several flights a day to the survivors. At times, they also dropped supplies to Captain Smith's land convoy. So there was this land convoy also making its way. I think we saw that. Where, where's that um, article? It's not that one. It's this one. So this is the land convoy over here. Can you guys see that? So they were also needing to drop land supplies, sorry, drop supplies to this convoy that is moving over land. Um, on 8 December, so we now passed a week into the whole rescue effort, Captain Smith's land convoy reached Rocky Point obviously attending to those other survivors of the tugboat and took them to a makeshift landing strip. There, Lieutenant Colonel Hubert landed a venture and picked up the tug surviving crew. So, yeah, you've already got um, rescuers surviving rescuers, right? Um, rescuing rescuers. Um, in Volfus Bay, Noreen refueled and loaded new supplies and on 7 December headed north again. It's quite interesting. There's a little spelling mistake here in this article. It just needs to be a capital letter. But anyway, we won't hold that against them. She reached an Eden Star two days later and launched her lifeboat. Again, it unsuccessfully tried to fire a line ashore by rocket, right? So I don't know if you know what they're trying to do here. I don't know why it's not letting me highlight that. 
Um, if we just try and highlight it from, you know, I'm trying to highlight it, but it's just not working. Let's try one more time. There we go. So maybe I can increase the size of the text for you guys. How's that? So they tr so what they're trying to do is they're trying to fire a rocket with a uh, a rope attached to it, and then the people on the beach can basically um, grab the rope, and that way they can um, help the lifeboat get to where it needed to go. In other words, the people on the shore can basically um, help the lifeboat navigate. Instead, Nareen's radio operator, Dennis Scully, swam ashore. So the rocket doesn't work for whatever reason, or it didn't fire far enough, or whatever. So you have a little bit of a hero in this, Dennis Scully, the radio operator. He ties the rope to his waist, swims ashore, and he makes the most of this not um, uh, terribly easy situation. That day, 14 crew, two women and two children were taken off the beach and transferred to the Nareen. And so, yeah, you had someone enterprising, thinking about use a rope with a boat and that'll help you get to and fro. And, and obviously it worked. So they've, um, they, they've now managed to get a substantial number off the beach, but they are still, how many was it? Um, I, th I think there's still something like 45 people left on the beach. Then on 10 December, eight more of the survivors from the beach were transferred to the minesweeper. So um, that still leaves, you know, about 20 or 30 people. Captain Smith's convoy then reached the beach and rescued those survivors who had not been transferred by lifeboat to Noreen. Smith's 11 trucks got back to Vintook on 23rd December, where the survivors stayed before continuing overland by train. They reached Cape Town on 28 December. So you can see it basically took a month to get themselves to, um, to safety. Um, you, could, you could say it, it took um, 10 December. It took at least two weeks. It took around about two weeks to get the last survivors off the beach. So, so you can imagine that was quite an ordeal for them. Two weeks uh, in that kind of um, environment. And bear in mind, there, there, there would be no shelter, right? It would be um, no electricity, no cell phone signal, um, no air conditioners, just the scraps that that had landed by air and you know and you would probably try and make a, a mattress out of it try and make some kind of um tent i guess out of the materials that they have i really think they should try and form a season of survivor on this particular coast see how well they do then uh says here on 17 january 1943 captain nordia left went to leading an overland convoy to recover the Ventura. Remember the airplane, right? So um, it's now basically two months later, and the aircraft is now still stranded in that area. After on-site repairs and a four-day digging effort, right, it took four days to dig the plane out, he finally got the plane airborne on 29 January. However, after only 43 minutes flying time, the aircraft, the aircraft developed engine trouble and crashed into the sea about 200 yards offshore near Rocky Point. So how many uh, vessels have been lost now? Uh, one ship, so a tugboat, this is besides the Dunedin Star. One ship, the tugboat, uh, one aircraft that was lost basically twice, it kind of got stuck, fixed it, and then it crashed anyway, right? Um, the wasn't there also another uh, rescue craft 
that uh, I don't know if they lost it, but they certainly couldn't use it. Seems like about three, right? It says Nordia and his two fellow uh, air crew members survived the crash and managed to swim ashore. Their returning land convoy rescued them on 1 February. So I don't know if you're noticing there's like a rescue and then those people need to be rescued and then the other people rescuing the airplane need to be rescued as well. Quite a, quite a lot going on. All of Dunedin Star's passengers, crew and Dems gunners survived thanks to the courage and the resource of many rescuers by sea, air, and land. And that really is um, an important word here. It really was, let me try and, uh, I just want to highlight the word courage. It really was courageous, right? Um, and resourceful. You know, that whole thing of tying a rope to yourself, also just not just putting all their eggs into one basket, but um, trying to, but, but basically acknowledging that, that this is serious, that, that shit has happened and that we need to have a multi-pronged strategy. Let's try land, but land's going to take a while. Let's try boat, but that's going to be tricky. Let's try by plane, but that's not going to, that's probably not going to allow us to actually extract the, um, survivors, right? So the fact that they had this multidisciplinary approach was really um, uh, good, you know, it was a good strategy. Uh, it says, but it was at a high cost. One Ventura aircraft, the tug, and two of the tug's crew were killed. So, you know, when when you have something like this happen, you don't just go there and rescue someone. It's it's a very um, dangerous um, operation in and of itself. And so there was, the, the, this did have a legal, um, uh, what do you call it? There, there was a legal aspect to the whole thing. Whose fault was this? Um, what really happened? Uh, was there a torpedo? Um, who's to blame, basically? And so this was the result. Uh, a court of inc oh, damn it. Let's try again. I don't know why it's doing this. The court of inquiry found Captain Lee culpable for the loss of his ship. And this is really interesting. Um, you know, remember he decided to beach the vessel. That kind of reminds me of that scene in Aliens where Ripley is brought in front of a kind of a commission of inquiry herself. And Van Leeuwen says to him, you do understand you chose to detonate and thereby destroy a, um, a, a vessel that's worth a really lot of money. Right, and um, and then she's she was actually found guilty herself. She was found guilty of um, doing something that she shouldn't have done. And so, what what else was this captain supposed to do? Um, anyway, what's quite interesting is what happened after this. Um, he was found culpable, guilty for the loss of the ship. Blue Star Line dismissed him, and he turned to be a pub publican in England. In 1943 or 44, Blue Star re-engaged him as the master of one of the merchant ships for um, for one of the Allied landings in Europe. Right? Um, what do you think happened? So you, you've got a captain that apparently was found guilty, and now you use him again. What do you think happened? Do, do you think? Um, what do you think happened? That's absolutely right. It is like that. Valerie says, I know those waters are great white infested. That's true. So what happened was, let's just go back to that. Um, 
after this contract, so he survived the uh, captaining, I guess, uh, or being the master of a merchant ship during the Allied landings, but then he wasn't offered another ship after that. Then he emigrated to India and he died shortly after his arrival. Uh, we, we don't quite know why that was. Um, did he die on land at sea? Did he die of some kind of stomach ailment? What what was that all about? But there you have it. Now, this part I find really fascinating. Um, the Dunedin Star crew, um, what happened to them? Let's just go back to that. So they went on to do other things as well. Six of Dunedin Star's crew, including an assistant engineer, went on to serve on the Melbourne Star and were killed when she sank in the North Atlantic in the 2nd of April, 1943. Now imagine you um, survive a tragedy like this, kind of by the skin of your teeth, and then you get on another ship and then you go down with that ship. Um, Dunedin Star's chief electrician went on to serve on the landing ship Empire Javelin and was killed when she sank in the English Channel on the 28th of December, 1944. So you've got... Seems like all six of these uh, crew members died um, on the one ship or another. Some of the Dunedin Star's cargo was salvaged in 1951. Some remains are visible to this day on the beach, among them a section of decking from the bow or of the stern. And then there was a successor ship that was built, the second Dunedin Star. Uh, the second Dunedin Star didn't have such an interesting history. It was, it never sank or, or was wrecked, but was instead scrapped in 1978 at the Gardani shipbreaking yard in Pakistan. So there you have it. So what do you think, guys? Quite an interesting story. Um, I believe that um, the ship ran 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 into a sandbar. And so that is what uh, was underestimated. Um, but it just, this story really illustrates just how um, harsh and difficult the conditions are and were, you know, for, um, for crews. Uh, someone wrote a book about this, um, this whole incident. I, I would love to read it. I would love to know a lot more detail. Um, and you find out a little bit about that in this um, thing from Wikipedia. It talks about the etymology, and it says here uh, where the name Skeleton Coast, let's bring it up, was coined by John Henry Marsh. So if you want to find him on Amazon, um, he wrote a book chronicling the shipwreck of the Dunedin Star. Since the book was first published in 1944, it became so well known, I guess it became a bestseller, that the coast is now generally referred to as Skeleton Coast. Uh, it says one of the oldest shipwrecks in the coast region is the Bomb Jesus. Um, it ran aground in the 1530s. That's pretty incredible. Pretty incredible. In March 2018, a Japanese registered fishing vessel, Fukuseki Maru, got in trouble and ran aground near Darissa Bay. Uh, all 24 foreign crew were rescued by Namibian authorities. Past human occupation by strontlopers is shown by shell middens of white mussels found along parts of the uh, shell uh, of the um, skeleton coast. Strunt Lurpers are, are just the original inhabitants who kind of lived off the coast. And so you get these shell mounds uh, every now and then. Um, there you have the Dunedin Star. 
And so the book is called Skeleton Coast by John Henry Marsh. So if any of you are interested in getting even more detail about this case, there you go. And that's it. That's really my story. I don't know if there's anything else I meant to. Oh, there is something else. So just another website that just uh, fleshes out our knowledge of this place. Um, it's, it was written, uh, I think it's a blog really. It was written about two years ago, so fairly current. It describes this area as the most inhospitable place on earth. Um, if it isn't, I think it probably is in the top five, you know, next to Antarctica and places, places like that. Um, I just want to read um, an excerpt from this blog. It says, let's assume you've made it to the Namibian coastline, obviously purposefully, that you're finding yourself some, somewhere above the Yugab and below the Kuneni River, and more importantly, that you have the stomach for this kind of adventure, whether on land or by air. Uh, boy, you're in for a treat of arid proportions. Only a handful of permits to this extraordinary place get issued annually, so chances are you'll have 1,600 square kilometers of virgin sand dunes all to yourself. To your footprints, your, your footprints will be the only human ones in the sand dunes for miles and miles. And Yeri says, now let's not pretend this untamed wilderness is every tra traveler's cup of tea, but those who get it are compelled time after time to return to this place where civilization has, yet, has as yet been unable to find a foothold. So let me ask you guys, um, do you, would, do you think this is your cup of tea? Do you, do you think being in this sort of environment is somewhere you'd like to see, uh, somewhere you'd like to go? Elizabeth says, I was in a bad storm once in a ship. I was so sick that the ship's doctor had to give me an injection as I was so disoriented. The ship's captain told me that most of his crew was sick too. Okay. Can you hear Timmy snoring? Yeah. Gina says, good sound. Good to hear. Uh, have you guys noticed a definite improvement in the sound or not really? Okay. So, Jalsi says, um, something happened that was quite unfortunate near the end of your trip. So I'm going to tell you guys two, two little stories about our trip. Uh, let's do it like that. I'm going to tell you guys two little stories about our trip. One was um, we we had identified shipwrecks on the map, and so we were literally – driving and then and then turning off the road onto roads that were already there and sort of driving to the coast obviously it's sandy road thick road uh, sorry thick sandy roads uh, or roads with thick sand and um, so we went to one and then you just find like a plank and then we go to another one and and there, there wouldn't really be much to see um and we did this a couple of times. And I think like the third time, second or third time we did it, um, when we sort of stopped, um, there was somebody fishing. There were two vehicles um, that were some distance away and, and they were obviously fishing. And um, there wasn't really much to see. We sort of wandered out there. Uh, you can actually see... Um, I think I posted some footage in this video.
I think there's some footage in this video. Yeah. So that was one wreck where you could drive and it was not terribly hard to get to. And can you see how deep the sand is here? So this is where we got into trouble. There is a vehicle over there, uh, I think. I think that's a vehicle. There were actually two vehicles. Um, but anyway, I think that's one of them. That's all that remains of the shipwreck. It's basically, as I said, looks like a washing machine. Not much bigger than that. And um, my vehicle, the, the, the vehicle we were driving in was just sort of uh, this way, but parked basically in this pretty thick sand. Let's see if the camera pans around. So there you can see a, the remains of a seal. There's, there's, um, I'm not sure if that was another one, but uh, let's keep going. Yeah, so can you see there are two vehicles here? And obviously, as far as the eye can see, there's, there's just nothing. There's no... Um, Telephone poles, there's no um, tap, there's no nothing. It's just sand and you and the sea and your vehicle and, and the remains of this wreck. So that actually looks like, uh, so there you can see the vehicle. Um, and you, you kind of got an idea of the sandy conditions. Um, I don't know if you can see, it looks like there's a bone right over there next to the wreck. So, so basically what happened was we uh, took photos, whatever, we weren't here very long, um, got into the vehicle, and then I was driving, and then we drove in kind of like a, a circle, like this. And if you remember earlier, you saw these tracks. And so I was driving kind of in a circle, but over these tracks, uh, we weren't quite this far out. Uh, this is slightly more moist soil, so it's kind of more compacted. Uh, where I was trying to turn, the soil was not only thicker, but drier as well. So just kind of like that and sort of that area. By the way, Earth, thanks very much for that. I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, so what happened next was, as I say, we tried to drive, make kind of a, a turn, and there the sand was kind of dry, and also there were very deep ruts of other vehicles. And so you'd cross over that rut and then, and then enter like – a pile of soft sand and then cross over another rut and then enter another pile of quite soft sand. And I, I would say I made uh, about 70% of the turn. I'd gotten 70% of the way around when the vehicle got stuck. And um, the, 
Brian then told me to, you know, like rev the engine like really high and, you know, um, basically get the wheels turning um, really fast and um, and then nothing happened. The vehicle just stayed where it was and, and actually sank slightly. And that was when I thought, oh, shit, this is, this is serious. And I, of course, I was aware that the other vehicles there could possibly pull us out. But um, anyway, I was definitely a little bit worried because the vehicle didn't move at all. It was just stuck in where it was. And we were surrounded by really soft sand. Um, we then put the vehicle into what's called diff lock, which is you make sure that the what, what actually happens is the wheels don't spin at different rates. They turn um, together. They turn at the same speed on the one side of the vehicle as the other. So we put it into diff lock, and Brian then got out the vehicle and pushed. And um, that didn't really... <laughs> That didn't really do anything either. And now my sense of unease definitely deepened. Now I was really like, wow, this is this is really, really serious. And again, I was aware that there were other vehicles there, uh, but they were some way off. I mean, they were they they driven by us and they were some way off. Um and um I actually got out the vehicle at that point and I, I even started digging a little bit. So I was kind of ready to start digging. And um, I think what happened after that was um, we tried again and the vehicle just moved slightly forward. And so what I did was I basically hit the gas, took my foot off the gas, hit the gas, took my foot off the gas, Meanwhile, Brian was sort of, you know, using his weight as well. And basically, it got the vehicle to shift just slightly and subtly. But it was just enough to get a little bit of momentum, get a little bit of traction. And then the next thing we got out of that situation. But um, I was saying to Brian, so we did get out. Um, and I did maintain quite a high speed to, to get, because it was very, very soft sand to get through there and then to get out. Um, but but I did say to Brian, you know, if we'd spun, if those wheels spun for much longer, the chassis would actually have sunk level with the sand. And when that happens, you're basically totally screwed. I mean, the only way to get out when, when you're that deep in the sand is you've got to dig the vehicle out and that can take um, hours, if not half a day. Right. And so because you can't just pull a vehicle that is sunk to the chassis out, out the um, sand, uh, that other vehicles also got to get grip and uh, just, you know, you're probably going to break your rope or whatever it is. So um, I'm pleased that we managed to get out of there fairly easily, but it was definitely a, a scary moment. Definitely was pretty scary. Um, there you get a, another idea of just how deep the sand sand was there. And, and of course, as soon as you're turning, um, the traction is slightly less because the, the sand is sort of bunching up in front of your vehicle. Can you guys see the sand over here? So in retrospect, I think... Uh, what I would have done is I would have either, if, I, if I'm if i ever in that situation again, what I would either do is <clears throat> drive a bit further forward <coughs> without turning and get to the relatively um, harder, moist sand and then turn there, or I would have just simply reversed from where I was. Um, I don't think that would have been too effective, but more that would have been more effective than turning over those piles of, of dry sand. What is nice about the close call we had was late in the trip when we were driving to the world's tallest sand dunes, there's a section where you're going through like a giant red sand pit. 
and it's very similar conditions to where we were. If anything, the sand's deeper. It's just a lot more furrows where a lot of other vehicles have driven. And so the fact that we'd been in that situation and gotten ourselves out of it definitely gave me the confidence to be in the same same situation again. And so uh, we put into diff lock again and got through that without any problem. <clears throat> <clears throat> is the sound back? So a couple of you have left comments saying uh, you, you should have li lower air pressure. <clears throat> Fortunately, we did do that. Fortunately, the air pressure was quite low. I, I think if the pressure wasn't <clears throat> as low as it was, I think we really would have struggled. So, yeah. Okay. So I think that's it from me. Can you, can you guys hear me now? Okay. So this is uh, the Cape Cross seal colony, about 350,000 seals in this particular area. <clears throat> and as I said, it's quite astonishing Miles and miles of nothing, and then all of this life. So what was quite unexpected here was the smell. It was incredibly foul smelling. And um, there was like this, like hairballs all over the place, like this um, biscuit colored hairballs, like, like almost like brown cotton wool all over the place, which is obviously um, seal uh, hair, right? <clears throat> uh, we also encountered a biker at the Cape Cross seal colony, who'd, I think he'd buy, bike from Poland or something, right across Africa, something like that. And um, he said that, uh, what did he say? He said 80% of the photos he took were unpostable because he'd taken photos of <clears throat> people in Africa carrying AK-47s and so on. So. It obviously experienced quite a few dangerous situations. Um, it was quite interesting to hear that. <clears throat> There's also a woman from Switzerland that we met there that was traveling alone. So there's a video of a wreck that's not far from uh, Swak of Munt. That is in Valfus Bay, and again, do you notice the mist? There's a, a, um, a buoy over there, and um, 
but everything kind of shrouded in mist. <clears throat> That gives you a good idea of how thick that mist is. This really isn't far away, yet you can't really see. And so, you know, if we come back to the original question, why did this happen? I would say the my my own opinion is that the um, <clears throat> the sand uh, created a sand bar, which which. Um, the ship ran into. So that's just my opinion. I think the reason this happened was due to sand. Of course, the fog and the currents didn't help. Uh, certainly didn't help anything. Uh, thanks a lot, Chelsea. Well, appreciate that. <laughs> I don't know if you can see, this is in the format of Land Rover. And so it's just um, a play on that. Deborah, thank you very much for that. Um, is there anything else I can share with you guys? Oh, there is actually something else. Um, these two articles, this is an article on CNN. Um, what's just happened? I think it's just uh, reduced in size. Namibia Skeleton Coast, a journey... I don't know why it does this. A journey through the end of the earth. And it really does feel like that. Um, th that to me is its charm. Uh, certainly not for everyone, but look at, look at this fantastic image here. You see the, the wreck in the foreground. Look at that violet ocean there. And then also this very unfriendly coastline. Uh, I want to show you some images from this article talks about a harsh environment. Uh, let's just see if I can find it. Now, I must say, I don't really like that. that, that that's, that's not a very, that, that looks like a beautiful tropical island somewhere. You know, that's not really um, how I think of Namibia. It makes it look very soft. But there you get an idea of the scale of the sea, right? Look how big those waves are. There's the um, Edward Bolin, I think. Just look how far inland that ship is today. It's basically turned into a sand dune. <clears throat> Again, I don't think that's the right way to convey the, the sea, the power of the sea and the surf. Um, that's the same ship you saw a moment ago in the video, right? Uh, that's the same as that. I really don't think softening the waves is the best way to convey what's going on with that wreck. Do you guys agree? Okay. Where's that CNN article now? A uh, couple of other images. There are some vehicles going down the dunes. Brian and I did actually go uh, quad biking on the dunes. That we'll share that with you at some point. That definitely was fun. Um, we saw some flamingos as well. There, there's the seals. It's quite a good shot, that one. Uh, lions and lion cubs, also a good photo. Uh, I think we're coming up on a really good photo in a moment. There's a nice shot of an elephant with a river flowing, and there's a big tree behind it. Caracal. And isn't that a great photo? So these are some of the other animals you do get in on the skeleton coast. Cheetah and some antelope. And those are some of the places you can stay. Do I have, uh, I think there's one more article I want to share with you. That's this one. What to visit in the northern section of Skeleton, Skeleton Coast um, Park. What do they say? Well, they are actually roaring dunes. 
And they say here, what does it say? Um, <clears throat> it says here, finally, hear the dunes that roar. This is one of the most exciting and extraordinary experiences you can make. As you slide down the steep slope downwind, the sand dune emits a loud, unexpected noise that reverberates around the dune itself. It is thought that the noise, similar to a roar, is generated by electrostatic discharges between the individual grains of sand when they friction on each other. But the reason why some dunes roar and others do not remain a mystery. The roaring dunes are only found in this area of the Skeleton Coast, in the Namib, south of the Honab River, and in the Witsant Natural Reserve in South Africa, in the Northern Cape Province. So just a little bit of trivia there. If you want to go to sand dunes that roar, that's where you'll find them. Okay, well, that's it from my side. Um, I've been away almost two weeks, so I hope you guys missed me. <laughs> um, but I certainly do have quite a lot of additional photos and footage that I haven't put out there yet. So keep your eyes peeled on the Team Petri channel. Um, there definitely is some more um, in store. Uh, what would you guys be interested in as the next live stream? Do you want me to do the verdict in the Hannah Gutierrez Reed case, you know, the armorer, but also not just the verdict, but also um, there was a, defense expert that really shot himself in the foot uh, just before the verdict. Uh, I'd really like to cover that, not for very long, but just maybe cover that. Would you like me to do that or would you like me to do something completely different? I've been thinking about it for a while. Do you believe in UFOs? Do UFOs exist? Um, and, and treat that as a critical thinking topic. Something that's a little bit off the wall, a little bit different, a little bit fun. Uh, which one would you prefer? We, we we might end up doing both. Which one do you want to do first? UFOs or um, the armorer? The armorer's verdict. Thanks a lot, Sandra. Appreciate your support there. Valerie says cover the UFOs. Uh, Valerie says uh, that should be a serious discussion. Okay. Sandy says rust, but quite a few of you are saying UFOs for sure. Sandra says verdict. Uh, Earth says armor first. Okay. <laughs> Titanic discussion says UFOs by a mile. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'll put a poll in the community page and you guys can vote which one you want first and then i'll go by what the poll says wolf woman says rust then ufos okay robbie robin says uh verdict and ufos but also vincent van gogh okay um i haven't forgotten about van gogh uh, i'll probably do that on sunday um elizabeth says definitely ufos okay so um yeah I'll, I'll put up a poll so on saturday we'll either do ufos or the rust verdict and then on sunday it'll be another episode of the in the van gogh letters series the poll will decide <laughs> Aristocat says, I'm cool with anything as long as Timmy is snoring. Well, I must say, when I came back, Timmy really looked very handsome. He had just been washed. He was very happy today because his dog walker doesn't walk him to his favorite walking spot, although she does walk him. Um, and so I took him today and he was really excited. Timmy, come. People want to say hello to you. Come, boy. Come, boy. Come. Timmy, come. Hey, come. So I don't know if you guys will agree. Don't you think Timmy is looking quite handsome? Yeah. 
you know, when he, um, in this light, you can see his eyes, but when the light's not shining on, on him, you can't actually see his eyes. So he kind of looks like Batman because you just see these two sort of dark areas around, almost like a mask uh, around his, his eyes. It's actually quite, quite interesting. I don't know how many schnauzers have that same kind of look. To me, I don't think wants to look into the light. Anyway, to me says, Hi and hi. <laughs> okay. Um, can you guys see that I've tanned somewhat? I've, I've definitely gone a shade darker. I don't know if you can see on my arm, but uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, thanks a lot for joining me here. Um, also, those of you who were uh, following the uh, post on Instagram, uh, thanks a lot for your interest. Uh, there's some pretty good photos up there, I think. Um, I've got some absolutely beautiful photos of flamingos um, that I don't think anyone's seen. Uh, I think I may have posted a couple onto Facebook. So, yeah, Sandra says you look a lot healthier. I definitely got a big dose of vitamin D. Uh, actually, I kind of screwed up my holiday. I went swimming in a pool in Vintuk only for an hour, it wasn't an hour con continuous, it was sort of um, uh, 20, maybe 20, 30 minutes, and then I rested, and then I swam another 20 minutes or whatever, and um, just in that short time, I really sunburned badly, um, I'm still peeling from that, so I, I kind of, st and that was before the whole holiday, so I kind of went on the holiday, um, kind of sunburned, and that's a very awful feeling when it's hot outside to be sunburned because even when you're in the shade, even when, you, when you've got a cool air con, it is, feels, feels warm. So um, I, I guess it could have been worse. I did use sunblock. I just didn't use nearly enough. So, so we learn, right? I did use factor, SPF factor 50. Um, the reason my face isn't burnt is I put it all over my face and my neck and my shoulders, but I, I ended up burning wherever I didn't put the sunblock. So, yeah. Winnie is swooning. Okay. What did you eat there? Um, well, we stayed at a hotel group called the Gondwana. Gondwana Co Do you mean what did we eat in at Skeleton Coast? Um I think we someone packed us a lunch, and in the lunch was like a chicken wrap, but we, we didn't eat that much. Did you wear a hat? I did. Elizabeth says, UFOs, something that my daughter and I witnessed together. Well, Elizabeth, I think you need to watch the discussion. I think you're going to find it um, interesting. <laughs> It should be quite interesting. Uh, Jalsi, thank you for being here. Um, and uh, I just want to thank everyone else who dropped by. I know this is not typical true crime fair, but, you know, this, this really is a story about, um, you know, what what is causing all of these ships to, to flounder and, and founder. In this area and, and i do think the answer is the idiosyncrasies of the geography especially these sandbars uh you know the, the fog doesn't help either so um i don't think it was due to uh foul play i think it was due to um human error basically and 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 nature's subtleties so that 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 i think is what we've addressed here and i do think it's an important thing to keep asking ourselves, you know, when is it foul play? Because it's easy to say foul play. When it's human error, we've got to acknowledge that we are sometimes, we can be challenged in terms of our perceptions. And the Skeleton Coast is certainly a place that is like that. Um, I, there's, there's a story I haven't told you. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll talk to Brian about whether I should tell you just a little bit more sensitive, and it was quite a serious incident that happened. Um, 
but I'll, uh, I'll talk to Brian and see whether what he says about sharing that sort of information. Um, I'm glad you guys have enjoyed it. Um, there's also another incident, I think, involving gangsters in Namibia that maybe I'll share with you guys at a later stage. Anyway, thanks, everyone, for being here. We had two hours, 30 minutes. Uh, thanks very much for all the super chats. Uh, there was a really uh, generous one from, uh, I think, not there yet. Just want to see where it is. Oh, no, it was from Run the World. Thanks so much, Run the World. And Maria, the aristocrat, uh, Professor Sheila became a member. Thanks, Earth. And thanks, Deborah. Thanks, guys. Right. Okay. Uh, that's all from me. I'll see you guys probably tomorrow around about this time where we'll talk about either, um, well, we'll see. We'll see. Have a look at the poll and vote, and then we'll we'll have the answer. Um, I will. I will. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, guys. Variety is the spice of life. Okay. Well, take care. Uh, wherever you are, sleep well. Uh, sleeping time for me, but I'm sure it's afternoon for you. Uh, and I'll see you guys next time. I'm just going to get the intro music ready. And then I'm going to say goodbye. I mean the outro music. Okay, take care, guys. Ciao.